Hello students from my American History 2 class. This is Mr. G. I apologize I was not there today, but you could all tell from the, the bad weather. Uh, I was unable to actually get out of my car. I was running through like a foot, foot and a half of water, which is disgusting. Um, it's not cooperating. Trust me, I don't miss class on purpose. Um, but what I wanted to do today, and I okayed it with Ms. Cochran, is I'm going to go ahead and put up a, a video for you, video lecture of the what I was supposed to talk about today. So uh, let's begin. I wanted to wrap up on American imperialism and we're going to talk about China. Uh, the United States had an open door policy that they uh, were going to implement and I wanted to point out again the uh, stereotyping of Chinese immigrants in the United States. Uh, they came here and they built the railroads and of course we had the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 which limited Chinese immigration to the United States. Um, actually it was 1882 not 1887 so I don't know where this PowerPoint came from but it looked good enough to me when I opened it up. Um, so um, you know what kind of dealings were we going to have with the mainland China? In 1900 there was, uh, let me get my face out of there so you can read the whole PowerPoint. Um, there was a, a rebellion of people who had rejected the foreignism in China. They were called the Boxers. And there was a rebellion in 1900. And there was a compound there that was inhabited by the Japanese, Germans, uh, some American ambassadors, and they were surrounded. And the United States sent in the Marines. President McKinley sent in the Marines to uh, combat this. There was a 55-day siege, and the uh, Allies had actually won the siege. They actually broke it and defeated the Boxer Rebellion. So we were there in China and I talked about the open door policy and what it was is there was being, uh, you know, you've heard me say a sphere of influence. The United States had opened their sphere of influence which made them more imperialistic after the war, uh, the Spanish-American War in Cuba and in the Philippines. Um, it, the open door policy was meant to give all nations equal access to trade in China some of them were cut off whereas you know Great Britain um, uh, occupied Hong Kong in China uh, guaranteed that China would not be taken over by one foreign power that's what the Boxer Rebellion was about they didn't want a foreign power taking over China they're very uh, very very uh, uh, proprietary there uh, and so the United States advocated this open door policy and we were there to make sure that it was going to run smoothly and we did for for quite a long time now if you look at this map you you'll t you can see where uh, the United States let me see if there's anything down there no okay um, you can see that the United States was in Alaska we had gotten Alaska from Russia in 1867 and made it a US territory in 1912 of course there is Puerto Rico uh, Cuba had its independence we occupied the Philippine Islands uh, in 1898 and all these other Pacific types of uh, atolls and small islands we had in the United States so the uh, I mean for the United States so the United States was becoming very imperialistic and by imperialistic I mean we were occupying a a lot of uh, territory in the interest of the United States interests okay so what is America's new role as an as a, as a power in the world okay uh, the social Darwinistic thinking. Now, let me explain this to you. Charles Darwin was a scientist who had done some research on what was known as the uh, origins of the species. He wrote a book about evolution. And Darwin believed that the strongest would survive, the fittest would survive. So he actually believed that uh, in some instances that uh, there would be um uh there there would be the strongest would beat up the young the the weakest and survive in a particular species well social darwinism is the same thing except it has to do with uh, uh society whereas we have poor people and then we have stronger people who are our society's uh elites um and that race played a determining factor in all of this including uh, you know the white race can be considered somewhat racist um, uh, 
and then there was you know the white man's burden the white man has to take care of all these people uh that was the thinking in the uh the uh, late 19th and early 20th centuries as far as america was concerned because you remember when we talked about the the philippine islands war there was american exceptionalism which went, which which spilled over into race and race meant that the united states had to protect everybody else because the other races were inferior so it was more of a it was also a political policy it was an administration policy rather than just a theory um the you know, we concerned ourselves with the growing families because we had a lot of unemployment at the turn of the uh, 20th century. And there were social reformers that came up that said, hey, we need to do this for the unemployed, we need to do this for the char charitable. And that's where we start to see the progressive movement, which we're going to talk about in, in a few minutes. Um, the United States uh, in 1904, uh, Teddy Roosevelt was president of the United States then. Uh, McKinley had been assassinated in 1901, and uh, Teddy Roosevelt took over as president. He ran in, in 1904 and won. But in 1904, Teddy Roosevelt expanded the Monroe Doctrine of 1823. Now, the Monroe Doctrine in 1823 basically stated, it was uh, presented by James Monroe, that the United States would not tolerate any more further European invention intervention into the Western Hemisphere. Well, Roosevelt, being the type of bully-bully guy that he was, and very American, very nationalistic, he expanded the Monroe Doctrine to include anywhere in the world that the United States was being threatened, or United States interests were being threatened, that he would uh, that the United States had a right to interfere militarily, well, intervene uh, militarily. So that's what this is about. The new diplomacy was to protect Americans all over the world, and, and this is a caricature of uh, Teddy Roosevelt right here. Now, Teddy Roosevelt was also a peacemaker. He won the Nobel Peace Prize. There was a war that was going on uh, between Russia and Japan. It was called the Russo-Japanese War. In, uh, started in, I think it was 1903 and went to 1905, and J Japan won it, actually. But Teddy Roosevelt negotiated a peace treaty between the two powers, and he actually won the Nobel Peace Prize for negotiating this treaty in 1905. Now, the treaty was signed in Portsmouth. I believe that's in New Hampshire in the United States. But he did win the Nobel Peace Prize. And in addition to being... Uh, he's not a war monger. He just doesn't want America to be disrespected. And uh, he wanted America to be seen as a, as a peacemaker as well. And that's why he went ahead and uh, brokered this particular peace treaty. Uh, in 1907, we start to see the rise of the, uh, actually, we, uh, at the end of the Spanish-American War in 1898, we started to see a lot of shipbuilding going on. If you remember correctly, I mentioned a gentleman by the name of Alfred Thayer Mahan, who advocated that the United States needed to have a strong navy if they were going to be an imperial power. So in 1907, there was a, they call it the Great White Fleet, the, the, because the ships were white. Uh, the United States had actually uh, begun building a lot of naval ships to uh, secure the imperialist, imperialistic uh, policies that they had put in place. Um, William Howard Taft became president after Teddy Roosevelt and he believed in what was known as dollar diplomacy and that is where the United States interest, uh, economic interests are threatened and that's we, we will go to war there. Uh, he improved financial opportunities for American businesses and he used private capital to further U.S. interests overseas. Therefore, the U.S. should create stability and order abroad that would best promote America's commercial interests. So what does that mean? What, you know, we, we deal in dollar diplomacy. What about people? Um, if it didn't concern uh, the United States making money or preserving any type of thing making money, uh, Taft, William Howard Taft, didn't care. So, uh, you know, that's what dollar diplomacy means. So, you know, we're, we're, we're an imperialist power overseas, but what about closer to home? Well, the United States was always having trouble with Mexico in the, in the 19th century. We had the uh, War for Texas Independence in 1836, and then the Mexican War 
from 1846 to, I'm sorry, 1840, yeah, 1846 to 1848, where we had to actually wrestle Mexico away from uh, our shores. But we were seeing a lot of things happening at the turn of the 20th century. Uh, specifically, there was a Mexican Revolution. Uh, Vittoriano Huerta seizes control of Mexico and puts Madera in prison where he was murdered. Uh, Venistiano Carranza, Pancho Villa, Emiliano Zapata, and Alvara Obregón fought against Huerta. Okay, so Huerta wanted to be a dictator. Uh, the U.S. also got involved with by occupying Veracruz, and Huerta fled the country. Eventually, Carranza would gain power in Mexico. Now, what does this have to do with us? Well, um, let me explain. Um, Pancho Villa actually turned against the United States and in eight, uh, 1914 he massacred a bunch of people in a place called Columbus, New Mexico and the United States went after him. We never did catch him, kind of kept us occupied, gave our troops a little training before World War I. But Mexico has always been a, a nation of uh, revolution and uh, civil war so we had to deal with that because it was really close to our our back door so here are the photos of some of the people uh, Emiliano Zapata, uh, Vinistiano Carranza, Pancho Villa, Porfirio Diaz and Francisco Madero uh, these were all uh, initial figures key figures in the Mexican Revolution in the 1910s now Woodrow Wilson was elected in 1912 on a democratic ticket and he believed in what was known as moral diplomacy. The U.S. should be the conscience of the world. We should spread democracy, promote peace, and condemn colonialism. Well, we were already involved in colonialism, as I stated, right after the Spanish-American War. But the one thing I want you to realize is, and I'm going to say this with my, my face on the screen, is that Woodrow Wilson was a racist. Okay, And when we start talking about World War I, we start getting into World War I, I'll explain to you why he was considered a racist. So this is what he came to the platform on in 1912. Later, in 1914, let me see where I am here. Okay. Um, John J. Pershing uh, went looking. He was a general that was later going to command the American forces in Europe during World War I. He goes looking for Pancho Villa in 1914, and Villa just eludes him. They can never find him. We lost some men. Uh, this was after that massacre I was telling you about uh, in 1914. We had religious and missionary interest in China. Uh, after the Boxer Rebellion, we had a lot of um, missionaries go over there to try and convert people to Christianity. Um, did we uh, actually believe it was going to work? Perhaps we did, but they were given protection by the American government because they were spreading the word of God through there. Now, this is a list of global investments and investments in uh, Latin America. We had a lot of investments in Latin America. You can see from the left uh, Latin America and the Caribbean, the, the fruit and vegetable trade was very big for the United States during this time. And um, there was a lot of interest to protect in Latin America, more so than in the Far East, the uh, Pacific East. Now, between 1898 and 1920, uh, we had a lot of interventions where we sent Marines to particular places to uh, quell some sort of revolt or some sort of riot or something of that nature. It actually gave our, our, our soldiers some uh, experience in doing so. Uh, we went to Haiti in 1915, the Marine Corps, uh, we, uh, and this would serve us uh, when the United States eventually entered World War I. Uh, Uncle Sam is considered one of the boys. This is a political cartoon where Uncle Sam is actually playing other countries for uh, control of, of, of their colonies. And it's very difficult because of the simple fact that the United States, they, they were new to this game. And they were basically playing it by the scene of their pants. But they considered anything that was economically beneficial to the United States, they would take advantage of. Now, another thing that we did, and we've discussed this uh, before, 
uh, we talked about the West being the key to uh, the nation's history through Fra uh, Frederick Jackson Turner's thesis that he wrote in 1893. The frontier was being closed. Um, and that being said, you know, uh, the government believed that there was nothing left to actually uh, discover. So uh, Indians were being moved to reservations, and the United States had finally decided, hey, you know, we, we're, we're done. Okay, this is what this is what we're choosing to do. So when we look at the, the history of the United States uh, becoming an imperial power, it's it's very difficult to um, actually uh, try and understand what it is that the United States is trying to accomplish. Well, what we're trying to do is we're trying to become a, a, you know a big we're trying to play on the on the world stage. And it's, it's becoming very difficult because there are problems that we're having in our own backyard and we're trying to, we're trying to seal those. So let me, let me put another um, uh, PowerPoint up here and I can, we, can, we can go into it. Hang on a second. Okay. What we're going to talk about now is... Uh, populism and progressivism and progressivism the progressivism movement came out of the um, basically the, the the need to take care of the poor the need to take care of the unemployed uh, just just people in society who couldn't make it on their own and so the progressives wanted the government to become involved with all of these things and so when we look at uh, chapter 21 and we talk about the progressives let me read you something from the book real quick the um, uh, progressives uh, families turned from their homes um, an army of unemployed employed on the roads hunger strikes hunger strikes and bloody violence across the country the wretching depression of 1893 forced Americans to take a hard look at their new industrial order uh, the uh, Entering the industrial age proved to be a rise in the middle class of the United States, which was not a bad thing because most of the taxes come from the middle class. Um, they saw a society increasingly divided by class, race, and ethnicity. Um, they also found common complaints that cut across those same lines. If streetcar companies raised fares while service deteriorated, if food processors doctored their canned goods with harmful additives, if politicians skimmed money from the public till, everybody suffered. Um, corruption was rampant in the United States. It still is, as a matter of fact. So what is it that the progressives are trying to obtain? Uh, attain? They're trying to attain social justice. Okay, Now you've heard that before. Everybody's equal. Uh, the result was not a coherent progressive movement, but a set of loosely connected goals that made progressivism difficult to categorize. Um, uh, you know, some of them wanted to fight to make government efficient and honest, and others called for greater regulation of business and more orderly economy. Well, if you regulate business too much, your economy is going to stifle, and you're going to have more unemployment. Some sought social justice for the poor and the working classes, like I said, and others social welfare to protect children, women, and consumers. Still, other progressives looked to purify society by outlawing alcohol and drugs, stamping out prostitution and slums, and restricting the flood of new immigrants. Now, is this going to make business better? No. Is it going to make society better? Yeah. It's going to be perfect. The progressives wanted a utopia, a working utopia, so that they can go and say, you know what, America's really on the cusp of change. We're on the cusp of reform. But the problem is, is that you want to root out drugs, you want to root out alcohol, you want to stamp out prostitution. These things are too deeply rooted to get rid of. Now, if you have a small town, you might be able to get rid of them in a small town, but not the nation as a whole because it's too big. Because let's face it, everybody's going to have a vice. Everybody's going to want uh, to get drunk. Everybody's going to want to get high. Um, you can't really stamp it out that much. It has to be done one person at a time. But the progressives wanted it done all at once. And we're seeing that now with social justice warriors um, we see. I'm not so sure we see it with Antifa, 
Um, I know the other day uh, some librarian said something about Dr. Seuss being racist. Really? Okay. Um, and, and they make an argument. The present day progressives make an argument to live under a repressive, tyrannical regime without admitting that it's oppressive, tyrannical regime. Doesn't make sense. But anyway, okay, so I want you guys to start reading chapter 21, uh, which is the progressive era. And when we come back to class on Wednesday, again, please accept my apology about the the uh, the weather. Uh, I know we can't control the weather, but I just thought I would uh, let you, uh, give that to you. Uh, apologize to you for that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say uh, goodbye, and I will see you uh, Wednesday at one o'clock. All right. Start reading chapter 22, the Progressive Era. Okay. See you then.